Trading Night, episode 121. When I started to learn uh, Smart Money and Wyckoff, it was probably, I would say, around this, around five or six months as well. Um, but more than the months, I would recommend people to think of the number of hours. And uh, just because my seven months might not be the same as someone else's seven months, I recommend roughly around 200 hours to master the strategy. The market's going to do something. Your job is not to fight it. The market never, ever runs away. It's always there. That personal diary of trading will make you a much better trader than I could be right about the direction, but wrong about the trade. Don't focus on the monetary side. Trying to make too much money on a trade is what I have seen killed every trader. Your losses offer you some of the greatest insight you can find into your mistakes. Relax, learn the process. Candlestick pattern training is a freaking trap. Don't be in a rush to become a millionaire. Let the market tell you what the market wants to tell you. This podcast is not financial, trading, or investing advice of any kind. What's up traders, welcome to another installment of the Trading Up Podcast. I'm your host Cam Hawkins and today we have a guest that a lot of you guys have reached out to, to, to me to get on the show. He goes by the name of Pips of Persia over there in the UK. Uh, so we've got him on finally and it was really worthwhile because he dropped an amazing resource later on in the show guys. I tried it out, it did wonders for me. So keep listening, you're going to find out exactly what that is soon. Uh, also we shot a video after this, he's goes through how supply and demand traders, what they do can be related to what Wyckoff, the Wyckoff method and manipulation and some of the stuff that he does as well. Look, this is a full course in its own right and a very condensed video, well worthwhile checking out. Uh, and while you're there, check out my Trader vs. Trader Season 3 series, which we're about to head into the semi-finals, guys. There's been some crazy entertainment here in this series. So please go and check out the uh, these videos because there's some... It's a craziness that goes on. Also, talking about videos, we've got uh, my first ever crypto spot has hit the Trading Nut YouTube channel where Nathan Sage, my silver sponsor here on Trading Nut, uh, who was, funnily enough, one of my Robot Builder Club students and that launched the whole thing for him. Uh, he talks through crypto markets and what actually drives the crypto market. So the likes of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the other coins, you can see his analysis it is spot on. In fact, he gives a great prediction for the thing that's going to spike next. So guys, well worth checking that out over there on the Trading Night YouTube, along with a bonus video that dropped later uh, last week, which was with James Ford. He talks through how Forex price flows in detail and uses some ICT concepts as well, of which... I ended up automating one of the uh, the concept for my students in the Robot Builders Club. So if you do join my Robot Builders Club, which is closing soon, you will get access to that ICT concept robot that I built for them uh, that went live literally in the last few days. Also, guys, do remember we've got the merch store here on Trading Nut up and running. So if you do want to sport a Trading Nut cap or whatever, wearing a Trading Nut thing out and about, I've been wearing my cap out and about. Nobody's come up to me yet, so I'm obviously not that famous uh, over here on, in New Zealand. So, um, guys, if you do want to get one of those, sport one and see if you can get find any other trading nuts out there, that would be fantastic. All right, let's do it. Here we go. Pips of Persia. Whether you're a struggling trader or a profitable trader, our sponsor, City Traders Imperium, are offering you the chance to become a fully backed Forex trader. That's right. Get coached and funded with CTI today. All right, folks, here we are. We've got Pips of Persia uh, AKA, well, sorry, it's Medi, AKA Pips of Persia on the show. Welcome to Trading Nut there, Medi. Uh, how are things over there in London? Just coming out of the, the toughest lockdowns, by I believe. Thank you very much. Yes, still in lockdown here in London. Cannot wait towards end of June. Hopefully things should go back to normal, but we shall see. Yeah, yeah, it's, it does seem to think, it does seem to be the case that we seem to be getting a little bit closer to normality. Uh, we've got a, 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 basically an opportunity to, fly to another country opening up hopefully uh t- today they're going to announce it so if that happens that'll be fantastic oh, wow. um so so uh let's get on with the show uh we're going to hear your story we're going to hear a lot about you know how you're trading your trading and uh yeah I'm, i really want to dive into the story first of all so how did you get into trading and, and can you t- walk us through your journey to to where you are now sure um so the journey in the making of the story that's in the making right now began back in um, beginning of 2018. I'm going to say January 2018 is when I got into trading. 
um, didn't have any idea about the industry before that, surprisingly enough. I simply came across one of my friends who was um, doing something other than your typical education route. I had no clue what business or investing thing he was doing. Um, we ended up sitting down and having a conversation about what he was doing and what he wanted to do. And he introduced me to all the, uh, towards the world, world of foreign exchange. Um, funnily enough, I had no idea about it. I didn't even know it was something that I, I would actually enjoy doing until I started to put time into it. Went through a lot of challenges, as you can imagine, at the start of my journey with greed and emotions and trying to control them and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, yeah, through the ups and downs, kind of turned that student life, I'm going to say, to more of a full-time trader right now. Um, and here we are today, after a few years, really after about well, three years and three months it's been since I've started to properly trade and get into the industry. Yeah, because there's a lot of people that have reached out to me and said, hey, look, you've got to get Pips of Persia on the show. Um, this guy's doing some amazing stuff. So, I mean, I'll be really keen to really dive into deep on your journey. So, I'm, just, you know, it sounds like you had some emotional things you had to get over. I mean, what, were the fir- what was the first thing you tried to do when you jumped into Forex? Um, the it was more so the excitement, the kind of seeing those first bit of profit on your trading account, whether it be 10p or one pound or a hundred grand, it doesn't make a difference. It's it's kind of that initial excitement that takes you over and in a way controls every action for the next at least 48 hours after that. So um, at first, when I was trading with you know correct risk management for the first, I would say around 10 minutes or so of my journey, it was going well. You know, I made some money, but Uh, as it would it kind of got to my head got me stuck in this cycle of you know you deposit money and you want to stick to your strategy and stick to your set of rules and stick to your risk management and you do it but because you're so new in the journey you can't help it you do make those emotional mistakes you have greed and you end up losing more than you're willing to lose and it gets you stuck in the cycle of wanting to make it back depositing more money risking more and losing more and depositing more risking more losing more um, until I kind of turned my head around and realized I had lost around um, a few thousand pounds. It was at that time. It was four, four and a half thousand pounds roughly. Uh, and at that time, as a student living in London, losing that much, it wasn't something easy. I'll be very honest with you. Um, but it was the exact motivation that I needed. The people around me kind of warned me against exactly what I was doing in terms of my mistakes. Um, so having lost that money i guess it it was my motivation to go back and start to learn and figure out the exact reason why that money was lost everything in my journey started with those losses it kind of made me obsessed with figuring out the truth behind the foreign exchange um you know you know the banks and institutions trade but do they trade the same ways as us what do they actually do and um why did i lose that money and how can i possibly make it back and whether or not this is an industry that you can properly make money from um so that was kind of, yeah, the beginning of my journey and kind of what motivated me a lot to want to find the true answers. Um, I changed my strategy a lot as well. I kind of, you know, did, tried a lot of different schools of thought, but eventually got to the stage where I started to reach the consistency needed um, to kind of make that money back, I guess. Just jumping in here, folks, with a quick message from my sponsor, Sage Strategies. Now, you might already know the boundaries of trading are expanding faster than ever. But you may not know that there's still time to take advantage of these opportunities. With my sponsor, Sage Strategies, you can instantly access institutional-grade algorithms that have been robustly tested by their team of experts. Their strategies provide fully automated responses to market opportunities in real time, which allow you to trade beyond human limitations. Go and check them out at sagestrategies.io or click the link in the description. And so what was the first kind of strategy you were using? Um, So... Back then, I was actually aiming for around five to 10 pips as take profits. Um, the risk to reward was non-existent. It was less than one to one. Um, and the, uh, well, it, it, it didn't really necessarily have a name. It was based on the 15 minutes or five minute time frames trading specifically based on uh, moving average convergence, divergence. Uh, so, well, MACD, Bollinger Bands, and uh, RSI and Stochastics. So as they lined up, I would take the trade for five to 10 pips. Very indicator-based strategy that I Started off with, uh, over time, I kind of moved on to more um, naked Forex-based strategies, you know, flags and different patterns and so on and so forth. And then the typical retail methods being your price reversal zones and trend lines, Fibonacci, um, you know, price action to an extent, divergence, all of these stuff kind of started to help a lot more, Elliott waves and blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, from there, it kind of moved more towards the smart money concepts and Wyckoff uh, under the umbrella term of institutional trading people. And kind of more so know it as. 
And so was there something in the, in that journey that sort of got you to smart money and Wyckoff and, and had you stop there versus carry on? Was there something you saw? What, what, well, what was it that you saw? So I actually reached a decent amount of consistency trading typical retail methods, support resistance trend lines. Uh, I've always been a swing trader, so I was always trading them based on higher time frame confirmations, which naturally made it more likely to um, kind of the trades to go the right way. But it got to the stage towards mid-2019, I'm going to say, where it wasn't as consistent as it was towards the end of 2018 and beginning of 2019. And I, and I simply could not figure out why. Um, something that I understood was that I was still in this, at the start of my trading journey. Um, so I was open to kind of learn more, to grow more. And when I started to come across, you know, hear the term institutional trading, obviously it kind of was a seed planted in my head from back in the day thinking, what is this and how can I learn more about it? And as I started to kind of be surrounded with more people who were trading smart money at Wyckoff and um, be able to kind of learn more about it, um, eventually kind of, you know, completely changed the way I started to trade. So the way I kind of got into it was more so the people around me and wanting to completely figure out exactly why certain strategies do not have that long-term consistency and was this were these people that people you sought out and found or were they people you just happened to be sort of in a trading group with it was um thankfully kind of the same community that i started off with from back in 2018 kind of the same platform the same community that i uh, learned everything from and do you want to share that community with us? or is Most that... definitely. I'm more yeah. than happy. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite open. I'm, uh, I started my journey from uh, well, you, being part of IM Mastery Academy from back in the day, uh, and I'm still part of them. I went through their course, even when it comes to kind of the smart money and Wyckoff aspects of things. It's their live education that I have kind of been through, if that makes sense. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, cool. And um, okay, so, so how much time did you have to sort of attribute or were you attributing to trading in your typical life back back then when you were really trying to get your head around it i was full-time university student and trying to work a lot of hours part-time as well so time wasn't naturally a, a, something that i had a lot of if i want to be honest but it was honestly whenever i could um you know, for for part of my journey i never understood the importance of organization the importance of a proper routine as a trader the importance of um for example even knowing what hours of day you're going to be free to trade so for me, it was any and every hour that I was free trying to learn more, trying to trade more, trying to educate myself more, if that makes sense. And um, from, um, you know, started, well, when I started my journey, it was probably a matter of, I would say, a couple hours a day or three hours a day if I could. As I started to progress more, it got to stages where I was actually putting more time in my trading than uni or working or anything else. So at times it was even five to six hours a day where I was um, learning, watching live videos, back testing, forward testing, making mistakes, making money, um, and yeah, going through the hours that the trader needs to go through. Really. And and how did the I suppose how did that sort of flip after you finished your uni studies? And you know, did you look to get a, a more full-time job or did you go straight into trading uh to be completely honest and transparent i stopped enrolling to university once trading started to go well so uh <laughs> technically a dropout yes. your parents are very happy about that i'm guessing <laughs> well they weren't at the beginning but after that they saw the vision thankfully right <laughs> okay so you so you dropped out of university and you uh you went straight into full-time trading you, you skipped the whole job thing um, I was, well, no, when, when I was at uni, I was working kind of part-time as well. Um, well, I, I quit my job through trading back in 2018, but um, the reason I kind of never personally, to be completely honest, consider that a huge accomplishment is because it was a part-time job at the time. It doesn't necessarily relate to someone who's been um, working full-time, you know, every, every single day or every single week. For me, it was a part-time job that I had at the time. Thankfully, I had the well, I had the option to be able to compound the account enough to not have to depend on another job and be able to take these things full time. Um, so yeah. Okay, and so so I mean, like, just to put it in perspective, I mean, at, at yeah. when you say compound it, it enough, um, you're living in London. You know, you're probably living a student lifestyle, so it's, you probably haven't got that many expenses. I'm guessing. Um, what what for you was enough to sort of go, or what was that tipping point where you were like, okay, I can actually quit university, do this full time, and quit the job, and be pretty happy with where I'm at, knowing that things in the future are going to look pretty rosy. What was that tipping point for you? 
So mentally, I quit uni long before I physically did, if I want to be honest with you. So, um, you know, mentally, I was completely out and kind of fully focusing on my trading and the business. Um, but the way I would actually kind of get people to start to look at it is your com- your expenses have to be covered at least twice over. Um, and student life is, you know, yeah, I, I guess, I guess type of student life here in London as well. But, um, I, I, you know, the, as long as the expenses, outgoings are covered, that's good. So it depends on every person. It really, really, really does depend on them. So think of people's rents, think of the food that they got to eat, think of whatever it is. Um, for me, I had to think of my rent that was going out different expenses for business related expenses for example different travels that i had to make to different cities and different countries a lot of in person events and trainings i would host um a lot of different money i would throw down for different incentives or help a lot of different um people that i'm working with privately or, or whatever whatever the different business expenses throughout the month might be um but more so the living expenses as long as those are covered twice over it's it's fine i'm happy with that um for me it was more so having that coming in on a monthly basis but on top of that, being able to have access to, I'm going to say, a chunk of money, <laughs> however, the, that chunk of money is going to be different for everyone, but a chunk of money that um, can support you, if that makes sense, whatever whatever happens. Um, and then for me, when I decided to take things full time, it was more so a matter of confidence in my knowledge and my abilities rather than the money made. And the money made was thankfully enough. The confidence was, can I still compound an account from three figures up? If I lose my entire net worth, and if the answer is yes, then you can consider yourself a full-time trader. And so when you're saying compounding a three-figure account upwards, I mean, can you give us an example of how that looked to you? So, well, um, I I started my first trading accounts by four figures. My first major deposits on my major accounts after the losses um, was roughly around £5,000 or so, if I'm not mistaken. And um, in terms of figures, I'm actually not allowed to mention figures I would want to, but this is the compliance aspect of I am tying my hands in terms of figures. But compounding that account from a three or four figure account to the stage that you would be comfortable with, knowing that you can actually pay off things and life would be upwards of six figures in my mind. So anyone looking to looking to take trading full time, it kind of makes sense to do that after six figures, not before, after six figures, anywhere over 100 grand. Um, and the reason I say that is because that's where a lot of different elevations in terms of my personal kind of psychology started to take place. The numbers are different. The risk is different. The type of returns you're looking at is different as well. And when you start to trade on bigger account sizes, naturally your daily routine could even be very different as well. Um, all of these things need to be experienced before someone wants to fully, fully, fully depend on their trading. And so by compounding, if you want to know exactly the figures that I want to see and i want to mention and i recommend to people is this three to six figures compounded or go for ftmo or whatever it may be <laughs> yeah okay cool and and so i'm quite interested in sort of understanding and you mentioned it before how you came up with a process you sort of realized you know you had to sort of attribute time to trading um come up with some sort of process to make sure that you were consistent and you're achieving that consistency how did you come up with that were there hurdles you had to overcome and things you had to do one of the biggest um, things that I personally had to deal with was self-doubt. Um, it was it's a, it's a very difficult thing to kind of go through a, a series of losses in, in your journey. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people listening to this would relate to this as well, where you're actually not making money from the industry that you really want to be making money from. And at the same time, you're not supported by the people around you, whether that be friends or family. So it kind of adds to the issue. That most definitely was a very, very, very difficult thing for me to go, to overcome for myself. Um, that self-doubt and all of these things, I had to continuously remind myself that it's possible. And not only is it possible, I am capable of doing it. Um, the biggest, um, the biggest, I'm going to say, kind of um, breakthrough that I had in my trading and especially trading psychology aspect of things was for a long time, I tried to always hush my emotions. For a long time, I was trying to be a complete robot behind the charts, um, no emotions whatsoever, not showing any type of emotions at all. And I feel like for a long time, that's the message that I had always been taught as well, no emotions whatsoever. And weirdly enough, the biggest breakthrough that I had in trading was it, you, you have to actually have emotions, but you have to not allow those emotions to affect your judgments. A good trader is not necessarily a trader that hushes their emotions and pushes it down and never thinks about them. A good trader and an investor is someone who has emotional intelligence, which means they are very well capable of feeling emotions. 
knowing exactly what emotions they're feeling, but they're also very well capable of not allowing those emotions to affect their judgment that needs to be based on facts. Once I understood this, everything changed for me. I started to actively, whenever I was looking at my charts, think to myself, is this an emotional-based decision or a factual-based decision? And in many, many, many times, it kind of puts me to take a step back from the charts, not take that specific trade or not or change my analysis or however I was um, approaching the charts or whatever it may be and approaching it with a fresh set of eyes and a fresh mind. And weirdly enough, it, it, you know, over time starts to not only help you with self-awareness, which means whenever you are trading, you would be more self-aware in terms of your psychology, you would actually start to see that you're taking a lot of better trades. So in terms of my biggest hurdles, that was probably a massive one. <laughs> It, it, we'll, and we'll touch back on the the mindset stuff there, and and that was a great answer, by the way. I love that the fact that you know you had to um, basically ask yourself that question: is it a, an emotional decision or a factual decision? The question is, how do you get to that point to ask yourself? And that's what I think most, a lot of people struggle with is is getting to that point where it's like I'm consciously actually going to ask myself this question versus letting things roll away with it with with the, whichever one you're going to go with. So we're going to dive into that in a second, but I do want to know um, a bit more about like the the process around you know the thing that you constructed that like here is my trading process almost like here is my trading routine. How did how did that come about? Um, so in terms of, you mean like, for example, the daily routine that I go through? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Um, currently in terms of what, well, in terms of how it got developed to where it is right now, uh, I simply started to look at my charts at a specific time every single day. And as I started to go through days and weeks, I started to understand I might need to do something before I look at the charts or during or after. And as, as I started to trade more and as I started to kind of take it more full time, it developed to what it is today. So I consider myself more of a swing trader. A lot of the positions that I take, I keep open for, you know, at least over the over one weekend. Um, I take a handful of positions on a monthly basis, if that, if I want to go for swing positions. Um, and however, having said that, from time to time, I do intraday as well. From time to time, I'm, you know, monitoring during London session behind my charts and maybe taking those intraday trades as well. Um, so it really does depend. Um, whether, for example, I'm, I'm on that specific week, I'm intraday trading or not. And I would know whether or not I would want to focus on intraday depending on the swing positions, which I will talk about a little bit later as well. Um, but generally speaking, right now, it would be um, being up before London session. So I would like to be up before London session, at least an hour before London session to start my day. Normally start it off with personal development, Earl Nightingale, The Strangest Secret. Hands down my favorite audio, half an hour long. I start my day with that. Um, and normally I start to analyze charts or monitor the analysis that I have had before and during London session. Uh, I don't sit behind the charts 24-7. So once I have my charts monitored, whatever currency pairs I want to focus on, normally I set my alerts and I get off and I get on with whatever else I want to do. Uh, in terms of whatever else that I do throughout the day, it would be a mixture of whether I'm doing meetings or one-to-one -one sessions or whether I'm cooking and doing housework or I'm recording a video for YouTube or whatever else it may be that I need to get up with. Normally, I don't need to keep monitoring my charts until my alerts go off. So whenever they go off, I keep looking at my charts and setting more alerts or um, um, more kind of stuff, more analysis for me to kind of have a look at. Uh, at other times, if I am trading on the lower time frames, a lot of the trade, not a lot, but some of the trades that we take are based on the one minute. And in some cases, the second base time frames, those are the ones that are really tough to just go based on the alerts because you're looking at small moves in the market and you kind of need to be monitoring it. In those times, I find myself behind my laptop monitoring the currency pair if need be. Um, as I'm doing that, I also find myself back testing and forward testing, always looking at different charts, looking at different analysis, not necessarily something that I recommend to um, people who are getting started, especially you don't want to confuse yourself, I'd say, with way too many different charts. Um, but um, but yeah, so in, in terms of my personal typical day, a typical trading day, that's normally how it begins. And um, just before slash open of New York session as well, uh, I normally monitor any major pairs. Uh, and those are the times that I keep most definitely eye on GBP USD, one of the currency pairs that I trade heavily. Um, and yeah, at the same time, I'm listening to news. Normally news is playing in the background of some personal development. I'm getting, I'm getting on with a lot of different activities. Normally after around 2, 3 p.m. UK time, I really don't find myself monitoring my charts a lot at all. After that time, most definitely it kind of goes back to alerts. Um, and yeah, awesome. that's, that's more or less a typical day. And and so you sort of mentioned the second, uh, sorry, you're entering on second charts. I mean, what what? Yeah. how low are you going? 
I have taken trades quite literally based on the five second time frame as well. Oh, seriously. And are you entering market or pending orders? Uh, market execution on second base time frames. Okay. And, and what about other time frames? Um, I'm a market execution person. The only type, the only time that I would do a pending order is if I know I need to monitor my charts, but for whatever reason I can't, I would set the pending order and forget about it. Um, but I'm most definitely a market execution type of person. And um, what about uh, the number of, sorry, how many trades would you typically take in a week? I would say if I am on, on, on an intraday week, probably I would say around five trades or so, if that, less than a three to five trades a week around these trades, these number. And what's your typical risk to reward ratio? Um, again, that also does depend on the, um, the, the, the swing position or intraday, but the risk to rewards can honestly be anywhere from one to 10 upwards as one to 100, one to 115 cases. Um, the minimum risk to reward that I execute based on is a one to 10. So I don't actually execute myself in anything under a one to 10 risk to reward ratio. Um, and the typical things that we catch on an intraday basis, let's say throughout the week, you can have maybe a few one to 10s um, either in a week, a few one to 20s even. Today we had, um, I paper traded this one. I didn't actually execute it for GU. I was seeing it, but it floated towards a one to 16 towards the end of the day. Well, it's, it does seem that the uh, the smart money um, Wyckoff methods do tend to yield a much higher R. This is me going off pretty much every trader that I've interviewed. You know, you typically right. I'll get a two to two or three hour trader on. You know, it's quite regular, but somebody who's hitting ten, twenty R, it mm-hmm. there does seem to be a common pattern around the fact that they seem to be smart money Wyckoff traders. Is that is, would you say that would be correct? It's. I don't necessarily think it's it's to do with the strategies, the way that it's taught. Smart Money and Wyckoff, like for people who spend the time to learn it, it's it's a literally a description of how the Forex market moves. There's so much more that goes into it as well. You know, a lot of people just trade it based on their, they, they see this kind of quote unquote institutional trading as just manipulations and trading kind of based on them. But in reality, it's just a different language of supply and demand. And it's truly understanding supply and demand. Um, and what smart money helps you to do is to see these things a lot clearer on whatever time frame you look at. Um, so you would end up seeing the fractal nature of the market. There's, um, you know, like, for example, entering based on second base time frames or even the minute based time frames was something that the 2018 version of myself, I would laugh at myself if I said something like that. I'd be like, what are you on about? Like minute based time frames, second base time frames? No, hourly and higher. And um, so it, it wasn't even something that it was in my comfort zone. but it's something that I have to be open to as a trader and figure out if it does or doesn't work. And through the hours that we've put in on the second base time frames, the market moves the same as the minute base, the same as the hourly, the same as daily, weekly, monthly. And it proved to me over the past six months or so more than that, to be fair now, it's been a lot more than that uh, in terms of properly backtesting these lower time frames. I'd say proved to me that um, <laughs> fractals, markets are fractal. That's it. It's funny because eh, like, uh, I think you are the first trader I've heard talk about second time time frames on the show, which is you mm-hmm. know we're we're two hundred odds, maybe even three hundred traders in. Um, I mean, so you said five seconds was the the lowest. What's your typical second time frame that you would go into? Fifteen and th- so trading view only gives you one second, five second, fifteen and thirty. And um, the one second it gets extremely gappy because obviously it's quite literally a one second time frame so it's just gaps everywhere on the one second time frame i'm normally looking at the line chart which you know doesn't doesn't give you that much confirmation so i don't find myself on that time frame a lot five seconds it's still extremely gappy still extremely difficult to see it that's the lowest i normally find myself 15 and 30 second time frames on normal four experts are analyzable and so they look like they're normal time frames which means that we can trade it like normal so normally it's 15 and 30 around these two uh, second base time frames. Um, and to be honest, the, the, I mean, may, maybe I'm mistaken, but I thought like the TradingView recently released the second base time frames. I only did it around, um, um, if I'm not mistaken, the end of 2019 or beginning of 2020, around then. It, it wasn't it wasn't there before as far no, as I know. No, maybe I'm mistaken. Not. Maybe I'm no, mistaken. I don't know. Yeah, you could be right. I, I, yeah, because I, I don't recall seeing them before that. But yeah, I think you could be right. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so so... What do you think made you different from the average trader out there in the beginning? Unfortunately, nothing. <laughs> That's why uh, <laughs> I kind of lost money. It's what I did after that that made me different. Um, consistency. 
I was extremely consistent with the hours that I was putting in every single day. That didn't matter what I had to do. Even if it meant sleeping three hours, I had to put in at least two to three hours a day to work on my craft. And, um, and consistency was a big part of it. Um, back testing the correct way and forward testing before I go live with anything was the biggest part of it uh, as well. And, and if you had to sort That's of explain probably. that back testing the correct way, how did you go about doing that? I realized that people back test to figure out whether their entries would have worked or not. That's probably the most, you know, <laughs> the wrongest way to back test, if that's even a word. You don't back test to figure out whether your entries would have worked or not. Because when you go back in the charts and you know what's going to happen after, unless you put it in replay mode and you go candle by candle and you make it fair, obviously, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. But normally people just go back in the charts and trying to analyze something that's already happened. You're eliminating so many important factors of a, someone who's trading live from emotions to actually seeing it live, to analyzing it top down live. Uh, all of these stuff is being kind of um, forgotten. So I came to the understanding that when I back test, I'm back testing to get my eyes used to seeing a trading setup. I don't care about the entries. I don't care about the stop losses. I'm simply seeing my, it will get in my eyes used to seeing an entry setup. So for example, for Wyckoff, the accumulation and distribution patterns is not uh, well, well, something that we have to get our eyes used to it and be able to see it. So when I was back testing, I was getting my eyes used to seeing them, not caring about the entries. And forward testing is my phrase for paper trading. So instead of actually executing the trades for a period of time, just paper trade the live charts uh, instead of trying to figure out the strat if the strategy works by back testing, actually test it properly for three months and see if it does or not minimum, I would say around three months or so that gives people that 90 day plan kind of gives people the consistency mm -hmm. that they need to see for that strategy. And so, so with the back testing, I mean, how did you go about like not sort of cheating and, and looking at the, the, where price was going on the setup? So for, um, that was the forward testing element of it for me. Ah, so okay, I, when, right, I, sorry, when I wanted to, yeah when, yeah, when I wanted to get better at actually analyzing it, I actually analyzed the charts and I was doing uh, a few different currency pairs. So I wasn't just focusing on one or two because I just wanted to have access to information to analyze. So I was going through different currency pairs, uh, having my bias entries and stop losses. I would save the currency pair on trading view and I would pay per trade it. Uh, and for the back testing part, um, if, if we have any kind of wipe off traders, what I personally was doing, uh, for me to identify a distribution, I have to identify the top of the market and the market has rounded off and dropped. So I would study areas of consolidation at the top, middle or the bottom of the market. If it's at the bottom and the market has rounded up, chances are that's an accumulation, vice versa for a distribution. And if it's in the middle of the range, the market has you know, consolidated in the middle of the range, that's a reaccumulation and redistribution. So all I was doing is highlighting those areas, comparing the schematics, trying to figure out if the behavior is similar uh, and trying to learn from it really. And the, uh, I suppose, the, the number of pairs that you're trading now? A handful. I find myself majorly looking at GBP USD right now. M mostly it's the major pairs, so the US dollar pairs minus USD CHF. I don't really like CHF pairs right now. Um, so mostly it's literally GBP USD and the other US, um, other US dollar pairs. In terms of other currency pairs that I look at, GBP JPY. A lot of people know that that's kind of another one of my very favorite currency pairs. I don't trade it a lot, but whenever I do, it's, a, it's an amazing scenario. And uh, back in the beginning, and I was going to ask this question earlier, but I forgot, how many accounts do you reckon you blew? I counted. I believe it was, well, I stopped counting at 14. So I, I, I don't know, <laughs> but it was most definitely 14 different accounts. <laughs> okay. um, many different brokers, many different amounts of deposits. It wasn't fun at all, I'll be honest with you. Because when I blew an account, I didn't redeposit to the same one, if that makes sense. So it was yeah. always a new account for me. And thinking about another retail trader out there who's coming into this uh, from scratch, what steps would you say, hey, go off and do this? So I, I guess that the very first thing would be to define define your strategy. And, and that's, that's a conversation. That's a different conversation. The, the general steps that I would say to take is for someone who's working a job, they need to first figure out what hours of day are you actually free. So what hours, Monday to Friday, can you dedicate to the charts? What sessions do those hours interact with? So, for example, is it the New York session? What, when is it during that session? Is it New York closed, New York open, London open, London closed? Um, and hopefully if it's at a you know good time of day, if it's not too close, for example, to daily close or daily opens, those are awkward times to be executing trades. 
Um, if it's on other sessions, then just figure out which session it is and which currency pairs would work better during that session. So if you happen to be free, for example, during New York, then you, 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 know, you might want to shift your focus more towards the USD pairs or practically whatever currency pair. If you're trading more in the Asian session, you can still look at any currency pair, but you would want to probably look at AUD and NZD and JPY a little bit more than other currency pairs. Uh, so that's, that's the first step. What hours of the day you're free? and what, what sessions and what pairs can you trade. So organization and planning every day. Um, and then you want to define the strategy that you kind of uh, obviously have for yourself. Now that depends whether based on the job that you have, it would make sense for it to be a scalping strategy, intraday or swing. I find it difficult to you know see if it's possible for someone full-time to be scalping as well, unless they have very specific hours during the day that they jump on the charts and take a few trades as a scalp and they're done. Um, you know, kind of on an intraday perspective, if they can check their phone during the work, makes sense. Um, and more of a swing trader, if they're genuinely, you know, is impossible for them to be checking their phone during the work or breaking even and monitoring positions. Um, so I guess defining your strategy is probably the most difficult part and the most crucial part of this answer. But it is also a whole other conversation on its own because it depends on a lot of different things. Um, and then the most important thing, well, two of the most important things that I would recommend is number one, having a guideline for percentage gain or loss per day or week so you don't overtrade. I don't, I don't mean have a target. I specifically mean a guideline. So when you say, for example, I want to make, example, 5% a week, if you don't make that 5% a week, you're not going to overtrade to get it. That's a guideline, not a, not a must that you have to achieve. But you also tell yourself, if I lose X percentage in a day or a week, I'm also going to stop trading for that day or for that week. And the final thing, patience um as and, and i know how difficult it must be for someone to want to quit their job and take this full-time um patience 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 it's about quitting that job when you're comfortable that's it and thinking about a price chart i mean what three things would you recommend somebody go away and study on a price chart um the three major things that i would say any and every trader would educate themselves on number one would be market structure um a little bit more than uh, what we know as low, high, higher, low, higher, high market structure generally, um, you know, what happens in the lower time frames within that structure and so on and so forth. So market structure generally, number two is supply and demand. Um, so where areas of supply and demand have been introduced into the market. And number three, institutional sponsorships. Um, so how can you identify institutional sponsorships on the actual charts? Understanding of these three would elevate one's understanding of the charts. And when you say institutional sponsorships, you, that means like the institutions have sponsored this move sort of thing? Is that what you're talking about? Exactly, exactly, right. exactly. So, yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, right now, so going back to the mindset uh, thinking, so do you have any sort of hacks or, or special things that you came up with to help you embed that whole like rational, emotional, am I being rational, am I being emotional uh sort of i suppose i don't know if it's a technique but but uh, methodology or, or theory that you came up with so i've been lucky enough to be studying psychology since i was 14 years old to be exact um ever since year 10 in in mm. in, in, in uk here i've been studying psychology and even at university uh, i actually studied psychology as well mm. guaranteed it didn't actually help me at <laughs> all with trading um <laughs> Funny, still, you know, yeah what, what, what it did though it's it kind of really made me interested in figuring out everything about the brain. And I, I really took it seriously when it comes to my mindset. And, and I'm very, very heavy when it comes to trading psychology and how important it is. So I'll give some of my own personal recommendations. And number one is personal development. Um, it's impossible to grow. This is my understanding of entrepreneurship in general, nothing to do with just trading. An entrepreneur is someone who wants to, let's say, grow their capital through the risks that they are taking. Now, for that capital to grow, the person holding that capital also needs to grow, also needs to develop. There's a reason why, for example, um, you know, so there's a reason why someone is not making a million pounds a year because they are not able to handle a million pounds a year. So I understood that. I was like, for me to make more money, I have to grow as a person. Solution, personal development. Favorite audio, I'll say it again, L Nightingale, The Stranger's Secret. And that, that's L, that L Nightingale, E-L? That's right. Right. Uh, e A R L and uh, Nightingale like night, ah, like right. uh, good night, and then night ingale. Yeah, ingale. The strangest uh, so secret. Spotify, I've never heard of it. 
the stranger secret yeah it's on spotify apple music so everyone can get it for themselves as well um i I absolutely love that uh, audio there's uh, other things that i have kind of um listened to or have gone through throughout my journey it goes without saying things like rich dad poor dad uh, think and grow rich and that's another uh, another book that i highly recommend and so personal development i'm not going to talk too much about it simply because i want to encourage people to you know, go and find your own personal development mentor. Just because I, you know, I, I'm saying Earl Nightingale, that doesn't necessarily mean you would also relate with him. <laughs> so spend some time figuring out your mentor. Uh, number two is affirmations. So I am statements. It took me such a long time for me to understand that that, that can actually be helpful to your journey. Uh, I was very heavily, weirdly enough, against affirmations, thinking to myself, how can I saying I am a six figure trader? I am a seven figure trader. Or how can how can me affirming it actually make it a reality? Until I started to understand by me affirming it, you're reminding yourself of where you're trying to go. That reminder is enough for you to actually consciously and subconsciously start to work towards that goal. So I started to affirm every single day and more so about the results of your uh, results of what you want. By all means, affirm it, affirm the journey, affirm the progress. You know, instead of saying like, I am, oh, I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm a six figure trader. Now that I'm a seven figure trader, you know, say I'm so happy and grateful now that I have a better understanding of the charts. I'm so happy and grateful now that I can, um, you know, reach consistency in my trading. I'm so happy and grateful now that out of the 10 trades that I've taken, I've won eight of them or seven of them, step by step. But these affirmations is also very important. Uh, Number three, reading books. That's another one as well. Uh, And weirdly enough, it's any and every book. Reading books teaches patience because you have to be patient to figure out the final message of it. You have to be patient to figure out what happens at the very end of it. So getting in the habit of reading books naturally makes you a patient person um also what i said at the beginning as well which is don't hush your emotions embrace them control them when you're feeling something when you're behind your charts consciously think of your emotions am i angry am i greedy am i scared am i am i anxious what feeling am i feeling right now once you figure it out understand that it's okay to feel that way and remind yourself i feel angry and it's okay that i feel angry i feel sad and it's okay that i feel sad whatever it may be, embrace it. And then also tell yourself, however, I am not going to allow that anger affect my judgment and go back to the charts. This might sound weird, but at the end of the day, these are the practices someone who hasn't developed that emotional intelligence needs to do on a daily basis. So it becomes second nature for them. And um, the final, final, final thing I'll say about that is positive self-talk. And I have a lot of it. I do a lot of positive self-talk. I'm um, you know, may might even be touching upon the verge of uh, egoism, I'd say, but no, I'm joking. I'm not egotistic, but positive self-talk is something that's really, really important. And I um, I actually learned this from Conor McGregor, surprisingly enough, uh, where he had this beautiful quote where he said, uh, I am cocky in my predictions. I am confident in my preparation, but I'm humble in the outcome. And that stuck with me where I thought to myself, I'm going to be cocky with my predictions for the rest of my life. I'm going to have insane risk to rewards. I'm going to make make insane amounts of money trading. I'm going to have extremely cocky predictions for the rest of my life, but I'm also very confident in preparation. So I'm going to remind myself every single day of what I need to do to get to that goal. And I'm also very humble in the outcome, however long it takes me to get to those goals. And I honestly think if people use these few points next to each other, they have that positive self-talk they listen to personal development they affirm their goals and they consciously think of their emotions before they know it they would be able to have trading psychology under control Uh, and it goes without saying um (laughs) reading books in terms of trading psychology is really important as well mental fitness for traders and mental fitness for traders is a is a phenomenal book uh, and trading in the zone which i'm pretty sure everyone has heard of already Cool. What an awesome answer, guys. You've got to rewind that and listen to it again probably four or five times. Um, just to actually just adding to your affirmation. So I did read a book. Uh, it was quite a while ago now, and I can't remember exactly what it was called. I think the the, the author was called uh, Noah St. John, and it might have been something like The Secret Code of Success or something like that. And he sort of had a different way of doing the affirmations, which actually sort of made a lot of sense. And it was pretty simple hack, right? So it's all the ones that you're doing. Um, it's basically with the mindset that you're, or the thinking that your brain is a question-answering machine. 
So instead of giving it a statement, you turn that into a question, and the easy way to do that is just to say why in front of the in front of the the affirmation. So like, why am I a six figure trader? Uh, and then your brain goes away and starts answering the question, and gives you all these reasons why you're a six figure trader or whatever whatever it is. So that that's a little hack if you want to <laughs> have a look at that book and perhaps add that in. Um, it's it's one of these sort of like small changes that that may make a big difference. Uh, right. We're going to jump into the quick fire round here, Mehdi. So to start off with, how long did it take you to go from trading newbie to consistently profitable? Um, let me answer that in two parts because I changed strategies kind of halfway through my journey as well. Uh, it took me around seven seven months or so to get to consistently trading um, retail methods of analysis or support resistance, trend lines, or high time frame confirmation, all, all, all of these um, kind of um, trading styles, uh, it's roughly around seven months or so. When I started to learn uh, Smart Money and Wyckoff, it was probably, I would say, around this, around five or six months as well. Um, but more than the months, I would recommend people to think of the number of hours. And uh, just because my seven months might not be the same as someone else's seven months, I recommend roughly around 200 hours to master a strategy. Righty ho. Okay, so 200 hours is what? Four weeks of. Is that four weeks? It's about four weeks of well, full time, eight hours a day. Um, right, guys. So, for what, uh, Mehdi, what about your favorite entry setup? What does that look like? Um, it would be the higher time frame trend matching lower time frame trend um, in terms of high time frame versus lower time frame. Again, relative. So, for example, four hour with the fifteen minutes, or hourly with the, for example, ten minutes and five minute time frames. Um, for the trends to be matching, areas of supply and demand to be very clear to identify. So, if it's a bullish trend, for me to be able to identify areas of demand very clearly. Um, then I also look for proofs of those areas. Um, so whenever I have had a major move to the upside from a given direction, I also want to get proof of whichever area the demand was introduced, and I simply take the trade. Long story short, higher time frame market structure matching with lower time frame market structure. And uh, upon a break of structure of the pullback in my desired direction, I simply look for things like imbalances or institutional candles for entries. What strategies do you use to exit or manage trades? Um, in terms of our trade management, we actually do it very differently to, again, any type of trading um, exit strategy. We hedge our positions. So a lot of the times we buy to sell. I execute a buy position before the major sell or a sell position before a major buy, um, which makes the future trade management much easier. Um, so first things first is hedging. That's how, how we actually manage our trades properly and when we actually manage our risk. Um, closing partials when the trade goes, um, well, when the trade breaks the relative structure is how I do it. So closing, closing partials or breaking the trade even when the trade breaks the relative structure and the relative structure is if it's an hourly trend you're trading based on, then it's an hourly structure that needs to break for you to be confident in breaking that trade even scenario to scenario is different. Um, but that's normally how I do it and break even based on break or structure and hedging to manage my trades. What's your preferred broker and trading platform? Um, I actually have been always trading on IC markets, international capital markets, not affiliated with them in any way, shape, or form. Hey, folks, ever wonder what broker I use? Well, I use Hanko Trade. It was a no-brainer because I was looking for a broker with good trading conditions and one that wouldn't restrict my leverage. Now, by joining Hanko Trade, I've also cut down my trading costs significantly with their super low commission of just $1 per 100K. You can learn more at hankotrade.com or just click the link I've put in the description. And the trading platform? Uh, I, I, oh, MetaTrader 4. Okay, cool. Um, do you want to walk us through your worst ever trade? Um, it's going to be a tough one because there is none. Like the, the worst trades that I would have taken would have been the ones that I would have risked way too much on. Any and every other trade that have been losing trades. I, I can't consider any of them the, the worst trades, if that makes sense. But um, because there have just been normal losses, right? 1% yeah. or 2% or however much the risk has been. Um, the one of the worst hits that I had on the account was it was just you know a matter of just confidence really that kind of gets to everyone, and um, where I risked uh, well, around seven percent of the capital where I shouldn't have, and the trade instantly disproved me. So that was not fun at okay. all. Um, now, last question of the show: If you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice, what would it be? Be patient, both in the learning process and the earning process when it comes to this industry. Patience most definitely will pay you. Cool. 
Awesome. Now, before we wrap up, what's the best way for traders to get hold of you? Um, you can actually contact me on my Instagram, Pips of Persia. Um, you can, yeah, my Instagram is probably the best place. I would actually never reach out to anyone to ask for investments or tell you to message me on WhatsApp. So anything that you might have heard from that sense is not true. And those accounts commenting on my YouTube are not me. So only Instagram people can only reach out to me on Instagram and nowhere else just to keep it away from the scammers as well. Yeah, ditto for me as well, guys. And I pretty much, I think everyone else out there who is on the show, um, they're not going to be deeming you on WhatsApp. Uh, right, so um, a big thank you to Mehdi for sharing with us today. Everything we discussed here, along with all the links, are in the show notes. To find them, simply search for either Mehdi or Pips of Persia in the search box on tradingnut.com. Until next time, I wish all my listeners trading happiness and success. All right, guys, so there we have an interview with Pips of Persia done and dusted. Do remember, go and check out the video he shot uh, over there on my YouTube channel, along with Trader vs. Trader, the new crypto spot, the price flow video. And if you do want to get access to the ICT concept I built for my Robot Builder Club clients, and you do want to learn how to build trading robots for yourself, then please go and check out my Robot Builders Club over there on tradingnut.com. Do remember, also grab some merch from the Trading Nut merch store, and we'll see you out and about in the streets of New Zealand if you're here, which you probably aren't because we've closed the country off. All right, guys, have a great week, and we'll see you in the next one.